we are going to talk about bossless organizations in practice, in action. So I would like to know, among you, who works within a big organization? Raise your hands if you work in a big organization. Okay, okay, that's about 20%. Uh, how many of you work on your own as freelancers or independent? Okay, okay. Uh, how many of you work in small companies like, you know, around 10 people or so? Okay, okay. So we have a very diverse uh, audience. Uh, who, now listen carefully, who among you has a boss? Raise your hand if you have a boss. Okay, so you, okay, you should be here. Uh, how many of you are the boss? If you are the boss, raise your hand. Okay, so listen carefully. Uh, we're not going to uh, chop your heads off, promised. Let me introduce to you um, Camille Panassier. She works in a biscuit factory. She works at Group Pult as an innovation manager, and she's a, a catalyst who creates conditions for employees to engage in the innovation process. Camille Panassier, please sit down. Uh, Nicolas Dodifre is the co-founder of a marketplace for handmade goods. It's called A Little Market. 50 employees serving more than 100,000 sellers on the platform. Nicolas Dodifre. It's, it's, a, it's a huge panel. We have, it's the biggest panel ever. We have four uh, people. Uh, Let's have Rodolphe Dutel. Rodolphe Dutel runs the operation in a software company called Buffer. It's an app. And he sees to uh, organize Buffer as it grows beyond 100 team members working loosely coordinated, remotely. And finally, from Italy, Emanuele Rapisarda. He's... Lots of, lots of people from Italy. Who's from Italy? Raise your hands if you come from Italy. <laughs> not, not so many, not so many. Uh, he's a multi-talented individual, an agile coach, a contributor to Cocoon Project, uh, which is based on a new disrupted, disruptive uh, governance model. And he's also working on a new company that he'll tell us about. Uh, okay, so... Uh, we're going to have a conversation. You'll, since you're four, uh, you'll have two or three minutes each to talk each time. We're okay about that. we prepared, you know. Uh, so you, you may have heard about horizontal management. You may have heard about management 3.0, you know, things like that, or even liberated companies. You've heard about that. Uh, so we need, to, we need to clarify a little bit. What do we mean when we say bossless management principles. Uh, the word bossless, you know, it has a fine revolutionary perfume about it. Do, do we have to get rid of bosses? Uh, do we have to chop off their heads? No, certainly not. Uh, do we mean that the founders, the inspirators, or the people who are legally in charge of organizations should act as if they were not concerned? Uh, that's another question. Um, do, we mean, do we mean that roles should shift or turn around every now and then and we uh, roll the dice to see who's going to be the boss today? Uh, that's another question. Or do we simply create conditions for every employee or every people in the, in the team to act as if he or she was the boss? of the company. So uh, let's have a look at what these people have tried that worked. And then we'll have a look at what they have tried that did not work. And we'll try to learn from, from there. And we will not, probably not draw uh, many conclusions 
but you will. Okay? So uh, we'll start with, uh, um, with Camille. Uh, please tell us what you did that worked and how you did it. You got three minutes. Okay, thank you. If you, if you want to stand up, you can stand up. If okay. you f feel, do you see her? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Hi. If, you, if you want her to stand up, you say, you, you know, <laughs> have a go at it. Okay, I think, I think I'll just stay seated. Uh, so yeah, I work for Pult Group. We are a biscuit manufacturer for private label. And we are 130 years old. And 10 years ago, uh, we decided to change our organization because of some performance issues. Uh, but we decided to change it in a way that every employee could be involved in the change process. Uh, and one of the um, of the principles uh, we we decided was shared uh, governance. Uh, and for instance, we removed the management committee, uh, so we don't have one anymore that uh, make a strategic decision. Uh, today, we have collaborative teams uh, that, for instance, uh, decide for investment for pay increase, uh, and for recruitment. So um, I will tell you about the investment uh, collective. It's about 15 person. Uh, they are representative of the whole company. I mean, uh, each jobs and each site, because we have five uh, production sites and uh, the social site uh, also. Uh, and these 15 person uh, decide uh, on which uh, production line or which site uh, we will invest uh, our capital uh, this year. Uh, and this group uh, is made of volunteers and uh, it's turning each year. So a third of the group is turning each year. So it allows uh, many employees to come in this group and to, to learn about how difficult it is to choose uh, where to invest and what is uh, the best for the companies and not only for his team or his site. Uh, and this process is working very well today, uh, so we are quite proud of, uh, of it. And I think, I don't know, three minutes? <laughs> yeah, 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 perfect, perfect. <laughs> we'll have more time in the end for questions or, okay. the, you know. Uh, well, you, you can hand your microphone to Nicola. Nicola, I if you want to say something in that concerns what, uh, what Camille says, you can. Or, or if, you, if you don't want to, the, the links will build uh, by themselves. Yes, because we, we, we had the same kind of, of questioning at A Little Market. Um, so before I explain you what were our issues and what were the solutions that we have implemented, um, just a few words about what we, what we are doing so that you understand uh, our issues. So A Little Market is a, is a marketplace um, uh, to, to help and made uh, creative people around uh, France grow their activity online. So we are basically a software company. Um, with a strong com community component. We are really dedicated to helping our community. Uh, so it's very different from other e-commerce companies that you could see. We have no, for example, marketing team uh, doing uh, marketing advertisement or that kind of stuff. We are very community-based. And I am insisting on this because you'll see that uh, it's part of the reason why we have changed uh, our organization. And so as a software company, like um, many other internet companies, we had basically three, um, three kind of, of groups to create our products, to create our website. So we had the project managers, so people with a marketing background, trying to understand what our users were willing to, uh, to get as a service and building um, project plans for our engineering team. And then uh, we had a second group of people the product leaders um, in charge of prioritizing uh, all the input that they were receiving from, th from the project managers to decide what we should do first and then explain to the engineering team, the third group of people, um, what they should do and what they should implement. So that we, we are a bit like a factory in the end with a, a lot of engineers receiving uh, plans and having to execute on the plan that they were receiving. 
And um, we had uh, several issues with, uh, with this organization. Um, the first one is that our projects were kind of badly built because very often we, we did not take into account um, all the constraints that our engineering team had at the other side, on the other side of the, of the production chain. Um, our engineers were very frustrated because they were just like saying, okay, we, we are just executing and we are not understanding why we are executing what we are asked to, to perform. And, and so we had a lot of issues in terms of improving our websites, our applications and all that kind of thing. And I, I have been thinking a lot about, about this issue to try to understand what was happening. And in the end, I think that I was mentioning you that we are very community-based. And what is a community? A community is a, a group of, of people sharing a, a same ambition, a same, pur a same purpose. And, and this group of people needs to collaborate, to be creative, to have a lot of freedom. And we were basically trying to put a community into a 19th century process. And if you have a company uh, which is very community-based and you are trying to do that, don't stop it. We have tried it for years and it's not working. I can tell you. Um, so that's really, we, we, we really noticed that actually we were trying to work against our DNA. Our DNA being to, col to organize collaboration within our group, but also within our community. And we had uh, the opposite as, a, as an organization. And so what did we do to, to, correct, this, uh, to, to correct this issue? Basically, we, 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 we destroyed the factory. Um, we killed the, the product leads. I mean, you, you understand the, the image. <laughs> We, we killed the product lead roles, I, I should say. And, and by the way, they were, support, they were promoting this change. So that was very interesting. They were saying, okay, we, we, we understand the issue, we need to change. And they, and they changed roles. So it was very important for us to have them on board. And, 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 and we created several startups within the company, mixing the three groups that I was describing before. So instead of having a production chain with one step, second step, third step, we put everybody in the same room, in the same startup, no boss, um, and, and, and we asked them to build, they had, each startup had a mission, so your mission is to really focus on helping our buyers find our products more easily. Your mission is to help our sellers be more successful. And they were building their roadmap, their plans together, deciding what should be their priorities together. And, and this organization has really helped a lot uh, driving a lot more motivation from within the team and also implementing uh, much better um, our product improvement. So that's, that's it for Great. what we have done. Perfect, perfect. You can give your mic to uh, Rodolphe. Hi everyone, my name is Rodolphe. I work at a startup named Buffer, buffer.com. Uh, we are an American startup. We've, we have 100 people today, 50 people in the US, 50 people outside of the US internationally, like myself. And um, we've always been trying to do things differently. So Buffer started five years ago, and we've always been trying to do things a little bit differently. So a couple of things we've done, tying back to the last panel about flat organization and getting organized differently, is to be very, very transparent. So before we experimented with busless organization, we started by sharing our salaries, for instance. So every employee salary is available internally through a spreadsheet and externally as well. So that people that want to apply to the company, for instance, can see how much they would make at Buffer. Then we started to share our metrics, which is how much we make per day, per week, per year. And we also shared our term sheets. When you're a startup and you go fundraising, there's this very secretive document that is a spreadsheet, that is a term sheet that you sign with people that give you money. That also we decided to share. So in our culture, we really want to be transparent and we really want to empower people to do things. As a consequence, we started to read about um, other ways to organize ourselves. We are entirely re remote, meaning we have no offices. Everyone's gonna work from the place that makes them the happiest, which is at home, from a co-working space, on the road, wherever you like. So building on that thought, we discovered the work of uh, Frédéric Laloux, who wrote Reinventing Organization, a great book about bossless organization and the decision maker by Dennis Bake. Two great books on the topic. And it started this very interesting spiral of what if, what if 
we keep doing things differently and we are parting ways with RRK altogether. So I want to tell you two short stories. The first one is in the first question and the second part is later on. We experimented with busless organization for nine months and then we stopped. So I'm going to tell you about what went well right now and then later I'll tell you about what it is that we stopped. So we really felt compelled of empowering people, especially in startups, small teams. You want people to be able to make a difference and to change very fast. So back to what we just said, um, it was great to see small product team getting to work together instead of having a boss, a sub boss and an engineer. It was great to see connection being created within company. A quick example is if something is broken on your software, your user is going to email your customer support department. How great is it that the customer support person can go and see an engineer and if the, they see together that something is broken, they can start a task force. This is how we call those little cells to fix uh, organization. A task force together, which is by definition temporary. So they're not going to work on this forever. They're going to work on this for a week, for a month, for two months. And they're going to be fixing it. So the mentality is the person that is closest to the problem or the opportunity get to work on it. And that parts way with management altogether. The second consequence is um, central functions, as you call it in a company, which is HR or accounting, can essentially go away in that setup. Because if the team are owning their profit and losses and the teams are doing their own recruiting, as we said in the first part, well, then you don't quite need an HR department aside from keeping things together. Nothing against HR. It's just a different way to do things where employees have more ownership. It's not only what it is you have in your job description, it's also what drives you as a person and when you want to go above and beyond deliver on it. So that has been an amazing experience and it's great to see people interact in ways that weren't mapped before, but how they do want to interact. Okay, thank you, Rodolphe, great. Uh, Emmanuel, you, you're going to tell us about two different things. N now, what went okay and uh, and then I propose we, we, we go reverse. Uh, uh, Emanuele, you will tell us what went right. And then directly, you will tell us about what went wrong. And then we'll go back, Rodolphe, Nicola, and finally Camille. Is that OK for you? OK. Uh, and we'll try to keep five to 10 minutes for the, for the, 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 the Q&A. Okay? OK? Let's go. OK, so uh, start with wha uh, what went good. As, as Pascal said, I'm starting to work on a new project. We are trying to redesign completely the way we think about personal and professional growth. And we are starting uh, from the beginning. So asking what is personal and professional growth for the people today. And uh, we are at the very beginning of this adventure. So uh, um, it's more important to talk about how this project um, is, is growing. And it is growing inside a company that has uh, a new culture, uh, a new culture based on um, the, the inclusiveness in the decision processes. So um, w when we uh, talk about bossless organization, we talk about someone that take the decisions or the possibility to, um, to allow the people to participate in this decision. Of course, there are a lot of ways to do this. But the most important thing, I think, uh, uh, I suppose, is the possibility to use the 100% of the power of the team or the organization. Because um, uh, if, if, if the system is based on two people that take decision and, I don't know, 50 people that uh, 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 execute, you are just uh, uh, losing the 98% uh, of the power of your organization, of the ideas of your organization. So um, uh, it's, it's very important that uh, um, when we think about a bossless organization, yes, we talk about tools and processes to, to make it happen, and uh, uh, that, that's, that's what, uh, um, the, uh, what uh, take uh, the, the system uh, in action for, for this, uh, this kind of... Uh, this kind of new uh, structure, but it's, it's very important to talk about the culture on which we uh, build our tools and our processes. 
So I, I will, I, I'm talking about uh, uh, this as a success because I'm building a new project and there, are, there, are, there is a lot of interest about, um, uh, for, from different people and uh, it's, it's very uh, uh, a good, a good uh, path. But I'm talking uh, also uh, about culture because when I will talk to you about a failure, uh, I will talk about a failure that is not related to tools on processes. It's related to culture and is related also to people. So, okay, let's go. I can start with the failure. Okay, uh, was uh, two years ago, and I was working on a project with five people. We was trying to gamify the high school education system in Italy. Uh, the words uh, very interest about uh, from the government. We was a six month of accelerating program. The idea was very, uh, very uh, disruptive, if you want, because uh, we were thinking about uh, a lot of new think, uh, things uh, in, in the education system in Italy. And uh, after three months, the, um, the group split badly. The project failed. And uh, all, all, all our, uh, our work just uh, disappear, and uh, I, I, I don't talk with two of the fi five people. It, it was a, a fight, very, very strong fight, and uh, I'm not happy for uh, about this. But I'm talking to you uh, about this project because a few days ago I read about a startup that is doing exactly what we thought two years ago. And they are, are growing very fast. They're uh, having uh, a lot of successful um, uh, interests. And uh, they, are, um, they are taking very important seeds. So the idea was the same. We had all the possibility to make the differences, but we failed. And we were a self-organized team, a bossless team. But that was not enough because we have to build our self-organized team, our bossless organization on people. And this means two things. Uh, to be sure that people want to stay in a self-organized organization, in a bossless organization, is not obvious. Okay? And the second thing is to be sure that we are taking care of them, that we are allowing them to grow and to, um, um, to be aligned every day with what the organization is doing. So don't lose your uh, attention on people before to uh, tools and processes. Thank you, thank you. So Rodolphe, uh, Emanuele has just given you the pace, the right pace for the, 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 the return ticket. Thanks for that. I think your point about people is absolutely great. We did do busless organization for nine months and the reason we stopped, the reason we failed is that Bossless doesn't mean chaos, but quite the opposite. It calls for a lot of things. It calls for enable, enablement through culture. What is it that I can do and cannot do? Assisting people think through that. And also, it's not because you don't have bosses that you don't have um, mastermind. You don't have leadership. Think about it. Leadership is situational. So you might not have a boss, but in certain contexts, leaders will emerge to take care of things, and it's great to embrace it. So if you, if you part ways with the traditional structure, it's great to start and think as a company, how are you going to be replacing this? And oftentimes, enabling through culture is a great one. And having no boss may call for even more structure or thoughts than having a boss in the first place. Um, so for us, the experiment was we have no offices. We are spread out in like 15 countries. We are a fast-growing startup, and we felt like making decision took too long for us. And last but not least, a startup is, by definition, a risky business model being redefined at all times. So we decided to go back to a model where we'll have more management, a little bit more management, to help guide people, to help people grow in the position as well. If we had another context, we may have done things differently. Certainly, we've learned a lot from that experience, and now, what we understand as bot bossless or flat organization is something we want to convey through empowering people to help them make good decisions, to be flexible about where they work, and understand that work flexibility takes management as one component, but not the entire equation as well. So it's been great to learn some more, and I think bossless can apply to 
great many organizations. Thank you. So same, same kind of story here, because I explained you uh, a few minutes ago the, the philosophy behind our change and, and really the motivation behind it, meaning that we had the feeling that we, we were not true to our DNA and we absolutely needed to radically change the way we were working. So in the end, I think um, it's not really a failure. It's more a, 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 a continuous uh, process to improve our organization. But we, I think we have been too radical um, at the beginning in our change. And, um, and, and so basically we went from like the 19th century factory to the anarchy. <laughs> and, and again, I told you a few minutes ago, don't try to put a community in a 19th century factory. Don't try to uh, build a company as an anarchy. Yeah, both are not really working, at least in our experience. So we've been trying to go kind of in the middle. And um, I, I really like the, the name of, uh, of this uh, discussion, Bossless. Um, but there is one issue with, uh, with this, is that we should not forget what is the objective behind it. And, and, you, and Rodolphe was telling, uh, talking a lot about empowerment, and this is exactly the objective that we were looking for. It's not really to, I know that in France we like to, to, to kill the boss and, uh, and all that kind of stuff, but the, the objective is not to kill the boss for the sake of killing the boss, it's to really empower the people and make sure that they can uh, reach their full potential. And, and same for our community, um, how do we help reach their full potential? And so what we, what we thought is that anarchy is not, uh, what, we, what we discovered is that anarchy is not working really well as a way of uh, organizing a company. And so we, we, we decided to implement an infrastructure to help our small, we, we kept this small startup spirit with uh, engineers working with marketing and, and no boss or or I will explain you how we have evolved on this question of no boss. But, um, so we, we kept this philosophy, but we say, okay, we, we, st we need to help this startup be successful. We, d we don't need to put a boss to tell them what they have to do, but we need to give them the infrastructure to, uh, to, to be more efficient. So what I mean by infrastructure is tools. <laughs> they were free before to, to choose their tools. No, we, we are helping them uh, building the right tools and trying to be uh, harmonized across the startups because we are all building the same product in the end. Um, we help them decide what should be their KPIs, on what they should focus on. So really, our job has been to empower them. And in terms of uh, our thinking around both, um, the, so we have not resurrected uh, the boss at uh, a little market, but we, we have created something a bit different. Is, Every, so we are organized um, in, in, in a session of two weeks to improve our product. And every two weeks, we, have, we are changing the boss of the teams. And it can be an engineer, it can be a marketing person. And this is actually a, a, a great way to organize the teams and to empower all the people in the team. So that's, I think, a, a good solution that we have found. Maybe in other companies, other solutions have to be found. Um, but so, uh, as you understand, it's, it's, we are not really any longer a boss-less organization, but we are a moving boss organization, which is, I think, a, a great way to empower the people. Great, great. Thank you. So next year, the session will be moving boss organization. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Please. <laughs> Can we? Yeah, I think the experience of Pulse is quite about the same subject as my co-workers here. Uh, it's about people and culture and change management. Uh, ten years ago, when we decided to change our organization, uh, we thought that it was enough to involve people, and so they decided how they wanted to be organized. So, for instance, they decided that they want to remove two levels of hierarchy to uh, make the decisions uh, making uh, shorter and to give uh, autonomy, responsibility to the to each team. So each team uh, is now able to make uh, is its own strategy and to implement it. Uh, but uh, we underestimate the change management because uh, we are a 130 years old company, we are a factory, 
uh, in the biscuit uh, market. Uh, so as, uh, as uh, you just said before, uh, our management principles were inherited from the 19th or the 20th uh, century and it's hard uh, to conceive work and management differently. Uh, so I think we, we overlook change management uh, because we thought as the employee decided they want to be organized uh, this way and they want to be autonomous and responsible, we said, okay, just be. <laughs> but uh, it's not easy to change uh, from one day to another. Uh, and we, we changed our organization very, it was very radical. I mean, one day we had a, a, hierar a hierarchy system and the next day it was gone. So there, there were many people that, uh, w whose job wasn't existing anymore <laughs> from one day to another and they had to find a new job. They had to change their ways uh, of thinking about work, about management. Uh, they, they had to change their vision so they won't be uh, just controlling teams but they, they would um, transit, transition to support. Uh, and it's not easy to do it by yourself. Uh, it's like you throw someone in the pool without teaching him how to swim. Uh, we te with um, 10 years after that, uh, we, we can look at our experience and now we know we shouldn't have done that <laughs> like this. <laughs> but okay, we did it. And probably um, we, we, we changed and uh, we made the culture evolve. But it was quite hard for, for, for some employees and the company is responsible for its employees and in, it has to, to help them to, um, to let their potential appear, to train them, so to be responsible, autonomous. And so now we, we implement uh, trainings uh, that allows people and teams uh, that help them to, as you said, to choose their tools, to choose their organization, uh, and to define how they want to how they want to to function. Uh, but we have to train them uh, because you can't say to someone now be autonomous and responsible if it hasn't done it before. Uh, it's not uh, like this. <laughs> well, thank you very much to the four of you. Uh, uh, as I heard them speak, a lot of connections, a lot of links and ideas came up into my mind, but I'm not going to tell you uh, because we want to keep some time for your questions. So I hypothesized that the same happened in your heads. Uh, and so, so now let's have it. Who has a, a question or remark or anything? I have one here. I'll lend you my microphone. Thank you. Hi, my name is Gina. Um, I'm part of the Inspiral Network and also lead Lifehack, a project that is part of the Inspiral Network. And the whole bossless practice really resonates uh, as something that we are finding our own way into within Lifehack in particular. And I've got two questions because I think it's, it's easier in concept than it is in practice to talk about it. So my, my two questions are, what is the single most useful recruitment question that you've found to help assess whether or not people are ready to work in a bossless or self-managing way? And the second part to it is, if it emerges that people aren't good at working in that way, what's the process internally that you have to either help them get there or help them transition out? Because it isn't for everyone, I think. Some people really thrive in a hierarchy and really need that. So what have you learned in terms of really, really practical things uh, to, help, to help with both of those questions? Thank you. Okay, so one about recruitment, one about uh, getting people through the change, Camille? Yeah, recruitment is essential because, uh, as you said, not everyone uh, is made for a bossless organization or flat organization. So at PUD, this is uh, a criteria that is very important, uh, even more important than uh, technical skills. Uh, so we make sure that people understand uh, how their job will be in our organization. And uh, we make sure that they will they will like it. <laughs> but it's not easy uh, during an interview, like one hour, to be sure of that. 
so in our process, uh, the person will meet like 10 person from our organization. So he or she will see a different point of view and different jobs and uh, he or she can exchange with those person and so make um, a global uh, image of our organization and then uh, chose or not to, to join us. Uh, and today we have not found yet how to, um, I don't people are not all made uh, for those kind of organization, but uh, we have some person who are there from 20 or 30 years. And so they were there before the change and after. Uh, so we have to help them change. And if they don't want to change, that's still a question because you can't fire someone if he, if he or she is very good at his job, uh, but he doesn't want to be collaborative. So it's very delicate question and we don't have an answer yet. Uh, and we, we do case by case uh, and we still learn uh, every day. Uh, but I think it's also an opportunity to improve your organization if the, these person are not um, involved or they are they have uh, critics about your organization you should also listen to them and improve your organization uh, like that one of you guys about recruitment or about change yes so that's a, a very good question about recruitment I think what we are doing is we are very transparent on how we are working that the first thing we really spend a lot of time explaining how the company works and then basically either the candidate is leaving saying who are these crazy people or staying and those are the, that's the first <laughs> that's the first selection process um, and 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 the second thing is more than testing for the qualities or uh, competencies of the person and does it match with our kind of organization we we test on we we try to make sure that we share the same values um, we have this, we, we have the same the same ambition the same we, we feel like we need to achieve the same things and I think if if we believe we, we are sharing the same values with the candidates um, it's 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 working because the candidate will adhere to our culture and it will work uh, and and the third point I, I will make on recruiting is that to us it has been more often um, we have attracted a lot of people uh, most of the time people are extremely uh, enthusiastic about our way of working and, and, and very often they want to leave a company which is working as we were working before so it's m it has been m positive um, for us to help us uh, hire new people um, we had one, ex one example of uh, one person not adhering and not understanding uh, our company uh, and the way we were working and, 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 and all the other people they, they joined us not only because of that but partly because of that and on um, helping people to transition out if they are not uh, feeling happy, I would say there are, there are two things to us. First, we are not looking for people who are, who are thinking it's amazing and we should not change anything. We like people who tell us, uh, I, was, I am coming from another organization. This is not really, I'm, I'm really surprised by this. We like to be challenged. So I, I, I would say we, we are looking to get people who are not finding that our organization is the best in the world. So we, are, we, we embrace uh, that kind of challenge rather than try to put these people out. Um, so that's, I think that's the main point. And, and the second point is, as, as I said and as I explained, when we build the, sorry, when, 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 when we build the organization, we build it with the team. And it was also coming from the team. The product leads who, whose role have been disappearing were really supportive, su supporting this change. So this has helped us doing it in a smooth way. If I may allow myself a small comment, uh, you see here a tension between culture. They, they said it, culture was very important, but culture is conservative. Culture is something that builds on the long run. It's not a machine that you design. It's a garden that, that you grow on the long run. And here we have, we have change. Uh, and so it's, it's a, a very difficult tension to deal with the tension between the conservation of a culture, which is very important, and the ability to change, to go to new things, and to abandon old things. So this is a, a, a delicate balance. Okay, and you want to say something about this, or, or, or we take another question? 
Okay. Just a small thing about culture. When I think about discussion from this morning, like every person I think that came here, the, one of the things we have in common is I think we all treat culture as software. You know, software, you have version 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, and so on and so forth. So essentially, I think most of people that spoke in panels this morning tend to over-invest on culture with culture trumping skills, securing the knowledge that if you really feel like being adapting as a candidate or as an employee, you will tag along with all the changes. It feels like we've all had different chapters where someone started working in the organization and then we made it different, different again, and I don't think any of us know what it's gonna be like in two years time. So we really look for people that are mentally flexible and able to embrace that culture differences. So oftentimes we can help people get the skills they need for the particular job if they have a good basis, but culture is a very hard one to bridge. And then you'll have French organization, international organization, but attrition can be a good thing, as in if someone feels that their calling is outside of the company, I think it may be that they might not be suited at all times. So this is not for everyone and cha preferences may change as well. So it could be that some people decide to leave the structure and company because they feel called to do something else, which I think is a very healthy thing as well. Do we have time for another question? Another question, where, here, person on the front row. Hello, I'm, I'm Sylvie. So those four experiences were very interesting. I have a question because it seems there are some commonalities, uh, at least between Pult and the Little Market, which is to reinvent the structure by breaking down into either collectives or startups. How do you ensure, as a group, that um, those um, substructure kind of still work together and that the startup don't compete between themselves or don't build something complementary? Yeah, it was the idea of the mini factories yeah, so um, at the, f the first time the, um, we, we failed at this, and when I explained that after having been very radical on our change in organization, we came back with a kind of middle approach, it's, it was uh, p partly related to that. So every startup was working with its own tools, uh, some were working on, on in two weeks, other in three weeks uh, time frame. So it was, uh, what, when I was saying anarchy, I, I was meaning it. Um, and, and we felt like it, indeed, maybe every startup was working quite well, but the, 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 the overall uh, organization was still not working as we were willing it to work. So that's why, and by the way, I, I see my role as really being a facilitator of the work of, of these startups, and I have to make sure that the whole is, uh, is working uh, well. So that's, that was our second step, and it was really related to what you described. Every startup was doing what they wanted, and, and in the end, the result of the whole organization was not great, so we had to implement an infrastructure to make sure that we were coordinating well. Uh, I think that's a challenge because when you give uh, autonomy to each team, uh, you have to make sure uh, we all swim to the same direction because we are all part to the same company and in the end we should all have the same goal to make the company grow, uh, etc. Uh, so in Pult we, we base on transparency, so each team should say what they are doing and what is uh, its strategy and put it in common with the other team, so uh, we know uh, at a global uh, level what are the strategy and we can make sure that uh, we are all going to the same direction. And another point is that one person, I mean uh, one member of the marketing team or the commercial team, will be a member of other team, um, maybe the cookies team or maybe the tartlet team. Or, and each, each person is a member of uh, several teams and transversal teams. So you can also make sure that, um, that the, there is a global, uh, global strategy and there is no competition between, uh, between two teams or projects. Thank you. Emanuele, something burning your lips? No, nothing new, uh, just uh, I have a word in my mind that is cross-pollination, you know, and uh, it's very important that, as my uh, co-workers co uh, said, uh, everyone uh, can uh, understand what the other 
uh, inside the organization are doing. And this uh, allow all the organization to be aligned and go in, uh, in a direction. It's, it's like vectors. You, you should have uh, very powerful people, but if they go to uh, different directions, uh, you just don't move. But if you uh, allow the organization to be aligned and uh, use the power of all these people through the co conversation, co-creation, you know, this kind of, uh, of, of processes, uh, of course, the, the things go in, in, a, in a very fast and, and powerful way. You see, conversation is a very physical thing. We have questions from the front row. We are part of the conversation. This is a question more for Nicola, but also for the others. I, I'm CTO in a startup, and I consider my, myself as a coach more than a boss to my coworkers. Um, I find it very difficult as a manager to do it, especially as my CEO does not have this view at all. So I'm talking to the top like I'm in charge and talking to the bottom like I'm a coach. Um, I think I'm succeeding, but I, I'm really curious to know how your organization of changing boss would work. Like if I was switching responsibilities, how would, how would I avoid like someone taking a different decision than me? The, the next week and how do we agree, how do we don't fight, how does it make sense and taking good decisions for the team if you don't have a coach, if you have... Uh, actually we do have coach um, like what we, what we are doing in your startup and, and, the, and the, uh, for example I, I see myself as a coach as well and we have a CTO as well who is a coach and he's not part of one of the startup but he's just here to facilitate and to help people think he's not in charge of making decisions himself, but he's in charge of challenging um, the people in the different startups to make the right decision. Thank you. We have to conclude because I see some people going out there. See them. Every, uh, everybody, everybody's hungry. Everything is always unfinished. So this conversation is unfinished. It's all in your heads now. Thank you very much, wonderful audience. Thank you very much, wonderful panelists. Full panelists. Full panelists. Full panelists. Full panelists. Full panelists. Full panelists.